the lord of the Rashi River. The summer days went by, and Susan lived very happily with the swans of the Rashi River. She spent long hours on a tiny island, covered with willows and hidden by beds of reeds and tall bulrushes. Sometimes she crept through the secret channels among the rushes, where the wild duck, the mallards, had their homes. If anyone else had intruded there, they would have flown up in alarm. But the lord of the rushy river had given his orders, and not a duck betrayed her. At night, when the moon shone, or at early dawn, she would swim out from the backwater into the open river and see the familiar fields and path and the sleeping village where she used to live. Every now and then, someone out late or very early caught a glimpse of her, and a tale went round that there was a water sprite in the river. But few people believed it. Every day, the lord of the river brought food for Susan. He collected it in a basket she had made from rushes, and which he carried in his beak. Sometimes he visited the water mill, where the miller's wife always gave him something. Or he would stop at the bridge and catch in the basket the best of the crusts and bits of biscuit which people threw down. Most days he called at the baker's backyard. The baker's little daughter would sit on the low wall, looking out for him. In her lap were buns or scones or rolls or broken cakes from yesterday's baking, and she little guessed that they would be eaten by a child like herself. The swan bowed his head courteously in thanks and swam on. Susan became taller and plumper, browner, happier and prettier every day. Only one thing troubled her. Where could she get a dress to put on when the time came to meet her daddy? Her old frock was nothing but a shapeless rag. At last, she explained her problem to Madame Penn, the mother swan, and Madame Penn discussed the matter with the lord of the Rushy River. My son says he can help you she later announced to Susan. Every Monday, the baker's wife hangs out her washing in her backyard. Next time he sees one of the little girl's frocks there, he will fly up, remove the pegs, and bring the frock to you. The child is just your size. Now, isn't that a clever plan? Isn't that just what you want? But Susan was quite distressed, Oh, please, Madam Penn, she said. It's ever so kind of him, but he mustn't do that. That would be stealing. I couldn't wear a stolen dress. Both Madam Penn and her son were puzzled by Susan's reply. The two swans were brave, patient, and kind, but they had never had to worry about right and wrong. Susan explained what was meant by stealing and persuaded them that it was wrong. But the Lord of the River did not give up hope of finding her address. On windy washing days, he always kept his black eyes open for a frock blown through the air from the village clotheslines. As summer turned to autumn, the seagulls flew up the river to follow the plough over the fields. But they always left sentries on the coast to watch for Susan's father. One day, a big herring gull came flying from the coast, crying, News! News! Wheeling in great circles, he descended to the old swan's nest where Susan and the swans had gathered eagerly to meet him. He then told the story of how he had flown far out to sea to a ship, sailing slowly to port. He had perched on the rigging and listened to the sailors talking about their families. One of them... A tall man with thick grey hair and dark eyes had talked about his daughter, Susan. There might be other sailors with daughters called Susan, but the gull felt sure he was the right one. Susan could hardly believe that her daddy was so near. She wanted to dance and shout and sing, but the swan said she must be quiet a little longer. So she sat down with Madame Penn to consider how she might make herself tidy without a new dress. The Lord of the River was thinking of something else. I'm going to see for myself that this is the right man, he said. And as the sun began to set, he spread his wings and rose up in the air. He flew to a ship which now lay at anchor outside the harbour. The wind had dropped and the tide was running out. 
so the ship could not enter until the morning. A group of sailors was leaning on the rail of the deck, looking towards the shore. It's queer for a swan to come out to sea. I wonder what he wants, said one, as he watched the proud bird land on the water and swim slowly round the ship. Why, I'm sure it's John's swan, said a tall, grey-haired man. I looked after him when he was a signet with a broken leg. Perhaps he's come all the way from Rushy Banks to welcome me home. The men all smiled and then turned to sorting and packing the treasures they were taking home for their families. Beads, shells, silk shawls and handkerchiefs. The grey-haired man shook out a beautifully embroidered garment which he had brought on deck. It was creased from having lain folded in his locker for many months. What's that, Jim? asked one of his mates. My word! It looks like a present for a princess. It was made for a princess, but she decided she didn't want it the moment it was finished. I bought it in a Persian market from a poor woman who had spent months working on it. I probably paid too much, but I felt sorry for the woman, and I was sure my little girl would look bonny in it. I'm going to hang it up now to shake out all the creases. He hung it over the rail and stood admiring it. And indeed it was a wonderful sight as the setting sun lit up its glowing colours. Around the hem was embroidered a border of leaves and flowers of every lovely hue. All over the dress butterflies and little birds and falling blossoms were worked with delicate skill. Except where, on the breast, was a great golden sun with long rays that went glinting down between the birds and flowers. The oldest sailor, a little wrinkled man, looked closely at the dress. That's fairy stitchery, he said. I've seen many an embroidered garment around the world. And you mark my words, Jim, it will bring you luck. She was a fairy and no mortal woman who sold you this. Suddenly, as he spoke, there was a loud swish, swish of wings. The swan had risen from the sea and was circling above the ship. At the same moment, a breeze sprang up, caught the wonderful dress and wafted it into the air. The men sprang after it, but the swan was quicker. He swooped down, seized it and carried it away. He grew smaller and smaller in the distance and the sailor could only stand gazing helplessly. Then he turned with a sigh to his bundle. All he had left were some beads and a tiny amount of gold. The day after, as the sun set, Susan sat waiting in a little thicket on the river bank where the wild clematis made a secret arbor for her to hide in. She had swum there early in the morning and it was there that the lord of the river had given her her dress. He would not say where it came from, but Susan was so charmed that she took it without question. After all, he was a wonderful bird, so why should he not give her a wonderful gift? She was all ready. She had said goodbye the day before to her shy friends in the backwater, but not to the swans. They were all now gathered in a group with their eyes on the bank. A traveller, tramping towards rushy banks, saw and wondered at them. He also wondered at the seagulls who seemed to be going with him, dashing ahead every now and again and crying and calling and then returning and wheeling around his head. Suddenly their cries grew louder and a girl ran onto the path in front of him. She stood shading her eyes from the setting sun that shone full on her rosy face and bare brown hands and feet. It shone too on her dress and showed all its fairy colours. The next moment, she started forward, and with a cry of joy, she was in her father's arms. The seagulls ceased their screaming, and the swans, all but one, glided silently away. There was so much to talk about, that when the stars came out, Susan and her father were still lingering on the riverbank. The birds had told her that other people were living in their old cottage, so the sailor said they would spend the night at the inn. Come, he said at last. 
It's time for supper and bed. But as they turned to go, she gave a last look at the river and saw her faithful friend waiting near on the dark water. Oh, Daddy, she said, here is the Lord of the Rushy River. He never said good night to him. The sailor took off his cap. My Lord, he said, I'm a plain man, and John Swan was the name I gave you when we met before, not knowing your title. But whatever I call you, I thank you, sir, with all my heart for your care of my little girl. Well satisfied, the Lord of the Rushy River bowed his head, then sailed majestically home. Susan and her father went to the inn, but they did not have to stay there many days. At that very time, the old ferryman gave up his job, and the sailor took it over. The little cottage by the ferry, a mile down the Rushy River, just suited him and Susan. In the years that followed, he never tired of telling how all his happiness was due to John Swan, the Lord of the Rushy River. And John Swan visited the ferryman and his daughter every day and felt proud of his share in their story. <laughs>